you know who sponsors this. Fieldstone Memory Care of uh, Bainbridge Island. Fieldstone offers uh, innovative and compassionate care, and they are accepting residents and also day stay mm -hmm. and respite people. Call 360-689-4314 to schedule a tour of Fieldstone's apartments on Rolling Bay today. Also, let's acknowledge that the Senior Community Center and uh, where we are meeting is the ancestral homeland of the Coast Salish people, specifically the Suquamish tribe, the people of the clear salt water. We are grateful for their hospitality and we honor them. Today, grandkids and uh, I hope uh, just kids of all ages, when we have the opportunity to spend time with younger people, uh, how can we make it meaningful for them and for us? And, and Lovejoy has put some thoughts together to get us started. Uh, so we'll turn it over to you, Anne. My grandkids are just leaving to go to their other grandmother right now. And it's so fun because we play ping pong with these kids sometimes. Um, I think one of the greatest joys in my life as an elder is being a grandmother, being a grandparent, and really sharing, having a real significant role in their life. And obviously, they certainly have a significant role in mine. Um, you can actually see this is the, <laughs> the part of my very small house that's um, designated as the play space. There's the kids' library. There's books and toys and building materials, all kinds of things. And that really means that when they're here, they're at home. They have their own space. And it really does mean when they come in, they just settle right in. They have place, you know, things to do, games that they are already engaged with, uh, all that kind of stuff. And that has made a really wonderful uh, haven for them when their parents are both working and I've got the kids. They can be here and play and do their stuff. And it's it's very comfortable for all of us. So I think that is awesome. If you can find the little space in your house to be, make a dedicated kid corner, it um, goes a long way to making them comfy in your house. Because I have remember very vividly being a child in my grandparents' house where we weren't allowed to touch anything, right? It was a very nice house. <laughs> And you were like, don't sit there. Wait, get off that. Wait, put that down. It's fragile. It's like, whoa, whoa. So I really wanted to make a kid-friendly space. Um, and I think that piece is really important too. But if you so, don't have that and it's not an option, you can always go outside. Sorry, Reed, what? No, I was just going to ask, so how old are your grandkids? And how long have you been uh, having this play space for them? I have had them since, literally since each of them was like a month old. Um, and the oldest is now nine, turned nine in June. The youngest one's six and a half. Um, and so I've had them two, three, sometimes four or five times a week um, since all, all their lives, which that definitely makes, um, makes us have a real relationship and a pattern to how they are here. I know that when you have kids much more occasionally, it can be harder because there's no pattern. There's no... Uh, ready-made stuff for them to just dive right into. And that's why I kind of suggest doing the kid corner thing. If you're going to be having the kids or you know they're coming for a week or something like that, it can actually be fun to set it up together to say, look, while you're here, let's create a space. What You know, you can have them engage with it. Um, also, I would really recommend if you're going to be having kids and you're not used to it or that, you know, haven't had that a lot, you might do a sweep of is anything unsafe? Is anything super breakable? Is there something that you would be crushed or devastated if it got wrecked? Because kids can get lively, right? And they should. Um, if you have a yard, you can go outside, right? That's one of the beauties <laughs> of a bigger space. But a lot of people are in small apartments. I have a very small home on a tiny lot in a small neighborhood. So going outside means we have to go somewhere else. Um, and luckily, one of the great things about being downtown in Winslow is there are some wonderful places to go, including the senior center because Waterfront Park is right there. We often will take a little picnic, go play in the park, wander down to the beach, um, take a bucket and a shovel and make a little sand castle, things like that, that um, doesn't cost anything. By the time they've walked down there, done their play, walked back, they're too tired to be rowdy. It's a bonus, right? And if they're uh, if they're relatively young enough, there's a playground on the way there and home again. Exactly. For very small kids, that playground is great. My kids have kind of aged out of it, but now and then they really, especially if nobody else is there, they kind of enjoy kind of sliding back into real young childhood and playing on the little swings and having a good time with that too. 
Um, and I think, you know, regression is great for all of us, right? <laughs> we need a little, yeah. a little space sometimes. Um, I also think, you know, sometimes what happens is the kids start to grow up and you now they're not really up for uh, arts and crafts so much anymore. But with teenagers, some really popular things to do are trashing, which is like making costumes or clothing out of recycled stuff. Um, and that can be really fun for everybody. Or if you have sewing skills or duct tape, you can actually renovate some of their clothes with them, like, or give them something of yours that, you know, they could refashion as a something else, right? Um, I think that is really a fun project. We've had so much fun doing things like that. Um, making costumes is popular with kids of all ages, essentially, um, and teens too, especially if they're into cosplay or something like that, um, which is costume, like dressing like a character in a movie or in some kind of graphic novel or that kind of stuff. Um, there's a, there's conferences where kids do that and they make costumes and go, and you can maybe help them put together supplies and think up how to put a costume together. We've made costumes out of, we made great Klingon masks out of brown paper bags, crumpling them for the, <laughs> that wrinkled forehead. They looked really good. <laughs> so just getting a little inventive is kind of fun. Yeah, that's, so um, obviously, you have a lot of experience with play, and um, I think that that's what you're talking about, the idea of, of, of taking materials and just starting to play with them. And um, so what kind of, if I were trying to put together a kit to get myself started, what kinds of things might I start to scrounge? Well, so the, my kids have always felt like the recycle bin is their craft shop. So they have found new uses for all kinds of um, the kind of plastic containers that you can't necessarily recycle. We keep those in a different bin and they've turned those into mouse houses, into little castles, into spaceships, into all robots, you name it, you know, some big ones too. Um, <laughs> it's great because they have, um, it, it really helps them develop their imagination and their ingenuity and they have kind of the luxury of failure sometimes when it doesn't always work, they get to work on that and try it again and come up with another solution, which I think is really a powerful tool um, and something grandparents have time for. Uh, you know, one of the pieces, don't you think Rita, like we really, you yes. know, sit a little longer with some of those things and let them, um, let them work at it instead of sure. immediately solving it for them. It's, it's hard because I think as grandparents, that's one of the luxuries that we have is we have time and we can arrange for that because, you know, as much as sometimes you want to let the kids when, look back on your kids when they were small, you know, do all this stuff, you're, you've got some stuff you've got to get done or you've got to be someplace and you, so you kind of hurry them along or you do it, part of it for them so that they, so that you can, you know, continue to right. live your get life to the exactly. get to the next thing right <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> this being older with grandkids is awesome it is actually it's really great i love it um because it pushes me too um and you know we, this morning we did a little bit of um peacemaking with popsicles when there's a, a wrangle going on and quarrelsome behavior I might say something like, you know, when they're screaming and yelling, there are zero popsicles being handed out. But when nobody's yelling, there's a strong possibility that there could be popsicles. Everybody shuts up. Oh, it's like, so get a bowl if you're not yelling, and then you could have a popsicle. Oh, okay. And that, that just breaks it up a little bit. And sometimes that's a really good technique for those inevitable moments when um, there's a little extra energy there that isn't being super productive. But if you're looking to uh, bring together supplies, Reed, I'd say one of the best tools, and I bet Rita, you'll agree with me, is a glue gun. And there's special glue guns for children called Cool Shot. And you can get them at that little craft shop down in Winslow, or you can get them at Ace. Mm -hmm. um, and right. they come with glue sticks that some of them have colors like pencil, like crayons, right? They're not just clear glue, they're like art. And there's some with little stars in it. I mean, they're cute. And so the kids have made all kinds of wonderful things from gluing a pine cone to a cork and making a Christmas tree and, and gluing little, they make tiny origami birds and glue them into the tree. 
<laughs> right? Or, I mean, that was a Christmas project. They've been doing that for three years now. So even as small kids, they could do that. Is it messy? Yeah, kind of is. You want to put a drop cloth down. So a drop cloth is on your list, right? Mm -hmm. Or one of those dollar store um, tablecloths, plastic, plastic tablecloths that have a little flat something on the back so they don't slip around too much. Those are good too, because you want it to, to stay put <laughs> when you've got all these things on top. Um, I find a piece of, like I have an old piece of sort of velvety fleece material that we use for beading. So that, cause the, they pour the beads out and they go everywhere. But if you put that in a um, one of the plastic containers that maybe chicken came in or something like that, has some sides, a piece of fluffy fleece, you can pour the beads in there, they don't go anywhere. So and they get to see, oh, this is another way to reuse, right? And you don't have to buy something. You're making it out of what you have around. Um, that's right. the other strong piece for getting crafty, I think, is kind of reevaluating what you throw away in terms of could this be something else? Yes. Rita, you do that too. I know you do. Yes, I do. And then sometimes um, my grandson's gotten a little older and he doesn't have some stuff, but we get packages from Amazon all the time. And so sometimes I'll save the insides and I'll bring them over to Anne and I just drop it off on her front porch. Because as there's stuff like if, if you get a case of wine delivered, sometimes my daughter sends wine up from California. The stuff that they pack that wine in is this recyclable... Um, uh, Peanuts? No. No, not, not peanuts, but it's molded and it's cardboard. So they've got all these cool things. So you can make all kinds of cool things. And I've dropped those off sometimes, or I've even given those to my grandson when he was younger, because it's just cool. You can make all kinds of cool stuff. You can make raceways out of all kinds of, of things. And again, just saving, you know, trays that vegetables come in and meat comes in and all, just all kinds of things you can save. It's cardboard tubes are another one. The cardboard tubes that wrapping paper come in, um, have been turned oh, into yeah. lightsabers. They've been turned into mouse runs. They've been turned into marble games. They've been turned into all kinds of things. Um, it's just, yeah, so that is another whole other thing. We took uh, tissue boxes and did Mac, um, what do you call it? Mod Podge and cloth and made really cool uh, handkerchief boxes that we still use to this day. Um, and they got to choose the patterns of the cloth and make a little mosaic out of it, or, you know, like a putting together a quilt with glue, it's easy. So Mod Podge is on your list. And a package yeah. of those little sponge brushes, you get them at the dollar store or Ace yeah. on dollar days. Um, those are great. And then you, again, you use a plastic tray from vegetables or chicken or something um, to put some of the Mod Podge in and one for water and rinsing your brush. And that is great for paint, for finger paints and stuff like that too. And you can buy powdered finger paint, so you only make a little at a time. And then yeah. it isn't really, you're not giving the kid a quart, which is never a good idea for a small child. <laughs> or, or maybe, maybe eat well, it depends. Maybe even not that big of a child. But I do think that teenagers and art go really well together. Oh, absolutely. And one of the cool things kids like to do is costumes and masks. And now, you know, we're wearing masks a lot. So you might take a very basic mask and really personalize it. Um, and the, the ones that are like microfiber are great because you can really draw on those. You can actually, you know, put fabric on them and still find, leave enough that they're breathable. Uh, but that can be a really fun thing. Or they could do a costume mask, full face, full head, you know, horns, ears, wigs, whatever you want. But that is really fun. One of the packing materials that Rita has brought me, it looks like pleated paper. It's like it, a number of layers of brown paper and they're, they're cut in such a way that they're really stretchy and so forth. And yeah. kids pulled them out and made armor, made um, like chain mail yeah. out of that stuff. And oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can spray paint it silver or, you know, paint it with whatever, like, it, it was fabulous. And then we did another one where they used that for kind of like dragon scales on a big construction. Oh, yeah. Yes. But if you live out, if you have a yard and you've got um, things like ivy, what, when I was at Bainbridge Gardens, we used to have a contest that was like, we gave prizes for the most creative use of, of ivy and other noxious weeds, like scotch or broom. And 
at one year, the kids from Suquamish Elementary brought the most amazing, they have a basket, um, a basket swamp kind of where they grow a lot of native basket plants. And they took the ivy and the scotch broom and all, reeds and rushes and they made these wonderful, really big animals by weaving all this stuff together with sticks and twigs and moss. And it was amazing. And they put them after they had them in our show. And of course, one, they put them in their, um, in their basket marsh to scare away, you know, <laughs> the wrong animals or whatever. It was cute. They were great. What a cool idea is that? And I know, Reed, I know you have ivy in your yard somewhere still up in the back, don't you? Yes, it uh, it is pernicious right yeah. across. I mean, I keep working it, but it's have to keep on top of it. But yeah, we could uh, weave that with some other stuff together into a um, lawn ornament. Bindweed is a really good rope for, for putting oh, together yes. instructions. And you know, if they feel like just to get them started, you could get a book from the library, one of those Andrew Goldsworthy nature art books. And show them, especially the older ones, because now he's doing much more big stone walls and stuff, which is not really going to happen. Not, <laughs> not my it. yard. No, not really. But the old ones where he was mostly making those amazing mosaics of leaves and shaded, you know, and tapestries of, of petals and stuff like that. Um, that is, and in the winter, he did ice ones that are amazing. And, you know, breaking off icicles, getting them wet, and then sticking them. Uh, he'd make a, like an igloo frame and then stick these icicles all over it. Not, you know, who knows? We could get that kind of weather again. We had a week of it this year, right? Um, but that, it's like play with snow, play with whatever the natural materials are. Um, that really, a lot of kids will do that. Even even 20-somethings will do that pretty happily because it's pretty fun, right? Now, I have a question related to uh, another topic we also often have with you, which is gardening. Are there uh, ways to introduce kids to garden activity that is um, positive for both you and them. Definitely. Let me start with one of the ways that isn't fruitful, and that is by expecting a young child to really enjoy weeding. Because seriously, no, like very few kids ever go, wow, that was so much fun. Please let me do that again. The only exception to that is with teenagers and a fire, uh, you know, a flame weeder. Burn, burn, that's a different yeah. story. Most of the teenagers will really enjoy the flame weeders. And with those, I just have a couple of caveats. You want to make sure you're working not on a flammable material like a bark path, hello, but like on the driveway, in the cracks in the sidewalk. And you always want to walk backwards. Having melted a couple pairs of crocs, I've learned that, that you, you know, you really do make the concrete quite hot. But if you have a stone wall with a lot of um, cracks in it, that's where slugs and snails are going to live. The kids will really enjoy cleaning out that wall for you, right? So there's one thing an older kid can definitely do in the garden that's actually fun. And but probably he, not, pro we're getting into the time of year where that's probably not the best activity as well, right? Well, if it's dry and hot, yes, yeah, totally not. But but, um, but early spring and for sure. All winter, totally, right? Um, pulling ivy is actually something a lot of kids, older kids especially, really enjoy. Because it's, you know, hands-on, you strip ivy off trees. I get them it's very them. satisfying because you can get, you, who knows where you're going to end up when you start. Right. And then you can take, we've had some really fun things where you take a, an old tarp and put it in your, your wooded area and then strip off as much ivy as you can. And you can actually make huge balls and make like a snowman out of ivy balls, right? Or make creatures. Um, and they can, but you don't want them touching the ground because some of the pieces are actually able to, sneak off and root again and you don't want that um but that is a really fun project where you can you make really big big scale garden art and also if you're going to the beach and you know there's a lot of beaches we can just walk down to keep an eye for a piece of driftwood that might look a bit like a something and maybe bring it home and it turns into a rabbit or a dragon or a dinosaur right um so found objects that could go in the garden and gently rot down that's always a good project for kids. Um, one thing my kids have always enjoyed too is making like mandalas out of flower petals. Yeah. And that is endless satisfaction to them. The other piece that you want to put in your craft kit, Reed, is micro little um, magnifying glasses that they can hold easily. And looking at bees and looking at flowers up close is magical. 
But the one thing you really have to be careful with is that they don't do it so that the sun comes down through the magnifying glass because you can kill insects that way and burn flowers. So make sure they're on the other side. Um, but I've had kids spend a surprisingly long time being fascinated by watching all the different insects in the garden, right? Or looking at a butterfly really up close and saying, oh my gosh, they have little scales on there, right? Um, it's, it's a different world, right? And then they can also draw what they see under that magnifying glass. If you've got some, you know, colored pencils or something there, it's amazing. That they, a lot of kids like to do that as well, to exactly. draw what they see under that magnifying glass, Yeah, which really helps. And the other piece that we always did, when I was a kid, I used to make what is now called fairy houses, but nobody called them anything then, I don't think. But I had read that wonderful book, The Borrowers, and there's a series of by Mary Norton and about little people, right? And I was enchanted with that idea. And I don't think I actually believed there were any, but I was just like, well, if there was, how fun would it be to make a little place to habitat for them? And so I spent a lot of time, like my dad used to try to make one of us go with the, to the golf course with him. Boring for a six or seven year old, no. So I would just find a cool space under a big tree with gnarly roots. And I would spend the whole morning weaving little blankets out of grass, finding little petals and making little, you know, snuggy beds out of moss. And I had a wonderful time. Um, and kids love that kind of activity. I think I always insist on two things. I, I want them only to use natural materials and found materials, no plastic, no little cute China fairies. You know, it's got to be real stuff. And also that as grown-ups, our most important role is to butt out. Like it's fine to bring some material that you think they, oh, like here's a bunch of bindweed, you could use this for rope, that's fine. But, you know, honey, if you fix the roof on that and did it this way, no, 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 butt out. Because again, they can really explore and develop their own creativity. And they have, again, that luxury of failure that if it doesn't work and they ask for your help, you can say, what have you tried? Okay, that sounds good. Oh, I wonder why that didn't work. Should we try it again? At, uh, when I used to run these at the library, the most popular things were the kids figured out that some of the pine trees were dripping sap and sap is fabulous glue. So they would take like the money plant, little round seed pods and stick some, you know, stick them on something with, with sap and it would, <laughs> would glue them on and they'd make pathways or roof tiles or whatever it was. Um, but it's like, surely you can find something to work with, right? And that- And those are, those are cool things that you can hide or have them plant in your backyard or your garden or your yeah. or your planter, whatever you've got, however big your space is, and mm -hmm. uh, they can come back and check on them. Yep. See if yeah. the gnomes have actually moved in. Well, yes, because when we did the fairy houses at the library, it was so amazing. Every time there would be fairy dust there the next day. So you never know. Booze might show up, right? Um, and they often, kids would come back and bring their families to look. So you didn't want to like rake it all up too fast. You want to let it sit. And that's, again, if it's natural material, it can sit there and kind of molder down and not, not cause any, you know, any harm to anything. Um, and it just looks a lot better, I think. But you can do that at the beach too, you know, yeah. and in the, you know, in the forest, in the backyard, in a park. Um, even the most well-groomed park usually has some area that's a little bit wild and you can find some stones and some moss and some sticks and some this and that. And those are the best tools and toys in the world, really. I know I'm amazed when like the wind blows in the fall and we get all the moss that kind of falls down out of the trees and the, and then the sticks, I love those, I save them and the kids say, oh mom, why do you have all this stuff? Because I like to, you know, decorate my garden with them, that's why. But it's amazing just how much you can make, again, without too much and you don't need much of a space. If you give the kids like a little space, like their own little space too, you know, in the garden, if, they, if you have the room, um, then they can kind of have that and rearrange it however they like, as often as they like. Exactly, and, and a little autonomy. Um, and you know, so many kids right. now are rushed from one uh, place to the other. School to uh, an activity, to another activity, to another activity. And a lot of it is very structured, which is fine, but it's really lovely for them to have some unstructured time and some unstructured play. And some kids haven't had that, so they have to get used to it. They have to kind of grow into it. But if they ever 
dare to say, I'm bored. You say, oh my, that's not an adult problem at all. <laughs> what are you going to do about it? Or I will say sometimes, okay, look, hey, look, I can look and see 50 books. I can look and see paints and glue and tape and paper and da 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 da, da. Um, I bet you can think of something. My kids like to play with stuffed animals and have inventive games. They're reading um, all those, you know, mouse guard series and stuff. And so they play with, they have a million mice that I've knitted for them. Um, but, <laughs> it, you know, the elaborate play, then they can make their own structures and, and build that into their games and around like the books they read or whatever. And making books is another great one. Um, you can make a book together of your what you did that day. You can make a book of family pictures, like a scrapbook or a collage that they could give to their parent, um, right? They could, it's like write a story and you'd help them illustrate it or they'd illustrate it and you'd write the words. Those things are all great projects that don't cost anything and they're really fun. I think one of the other things I was thinking of this the other day too, Anne, is that, you know, all the, we have so many pictures on our phone that it would be good just to, you know, once a month to just print some, just print a few off to have for kids to, to do because, you know, I've got, I, all of us do have boxes and boxes of old pictures that we could, you know, I used to look through them and that was our favorite evening Thing and tell stories and you know you would know the stories of your family I think we've lost that a lot I mean I, I know that our family has and so I was just thinking gee if I had some pictures you know that would be good and the kids could use them to write or tell you know tell something so that's something else I I think I I was just thinking about it'd be good to get a few pictures printed off occasionally and have a box of them for it for them that is a great idea. And the thing is, if they make a collage, you can copy pictures of that and they can send them to their cousins and say, here's the stories I learned about these pictures or whatever. Right. Right. So there, it would help them build that family relationship that it's some different. of us really don't have much of that anymore at all. You're right. No. Um, yeah. I know when, when I was clearing out my mom's apartment, there was a lot of pictures that nobody knew who anybody was anymore. And, exactly. you know, it, sorry, <laughs> but, but that's sort of lost history. And, and maybe that's okay. You may, but there's stories that, that build community. And when we don't have those family stories or those community stories, then I think we do feel a little more rootless or, you know, less connected. And, and I think building those connections, however we can, that's a valuable elder skill that we can kind of pass along for our whole family, really. You're right on. Yeah, I could also see with older kids, if they're sort of screen if you have if you have a we're talking about a lot of things that don't involve screens which is absolutely wonderful uh but also that uh, they could possibly make a notebook of uh, a uh photo show in uh google photos or OneDrive, and they mm -hmm. write next to the graphic pictures and those can be shared uh just sure. with links right it's kind of more of an indoor activity and uh but but we do spend a lot of time on screens, and this is much better than being, say, uh, scrolling TikTok. Exactly. And the other fun thing they can do is put on a little skit and video it and send yes. that, you know, um, or sing a song together and video that and send it. You know, there's that you're right, because the kids can do a lot more of the screen stuff. I tend to not do that just because I know they get plenty of it. Um, and, and it's not something, it's not my strength, really. But I think you're right, Reed, that sort of if that's where they're at and that's the tools they're most familiar with, then great, right? They can keep developing them. Uh, one thing I meant to talk about earlier was um, there's this pamphlet from Parks and Rec about trails all over the island, and it's a big map, like big scale oh. thing that with all the park, with the um, trails that you can walk on. And so that free, they, they have them at the library. Um, maybe we should oh. get some for that. We could ask for some for the senior center read. Oh, yes. that would be great. Especially because we have a walking group now, right? Um, mm -hmm. And that might be a good resource for them. But it's fun wherever you live. You can just open it up and say, well, what's near us? Because there's really a lot of trails on the island. And many of them are fairly small and not well known. So you don't no. meet a ton of people or get run over by a bicycle <laughs> while you're walking around <laughs> with a three-year-old, right? Um, but that and all the road ends are fun to explore with children. You know, the public road ends are places we can access the water. 
I like Faye Bainbridge too, because it's got, you know, the, the sand you can actually make a sand castle with. You can take sand toys down there. Um, it's got the picnic shelters and the grills and stuff like that. So if you want to have a little more formal experience or a whole family experience, that's obviously a really good place to, to take the family. But for just walking around with a kid, I love Waterfront Park myself, partly because it's in my own neighborhood, but also because it's just so simple, right? right? It's not all fancied up and they kept a like we spent an hour there the other day skipping stones. Oh, right. Well, yes. And at the end of um, where you go down by those condos, I don't know if you know this, you probably do. When you go down to those condos, like down Olympic Way, when you're first coming off the ferry, where, where you come across, there is like a public road end to get down to the beach. A lot of people don't know that. And that, when the tide is out, is a fabulous beach to yes. be able to go and sit on. And there's all kinds of stuff. I mean, you can walk way around to, um, maybe it's Merton Cove over there. Um, it's, uh, great... it's Holly Cove and there's a, there's a park there as well. Right. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Exactly. And those are really underused, which is nice. Right, exactly. And so um, that's another idea. The thing that my, when my grandson was smaller, I bought a picnic basket at a second hand, the second hand store because he wanted his own picnic basket. Because And then he, uh, several times we would pack some sandwiches and put a little tablecloth and he'd like to go to Battle Point and then we could have a picnic and he could play. So you can have them help. You know, so if they've got their own picnic basket, it's like they're kind of their picnic basket and then they can kind of help with that as well. Yeah, and they can pack, plan and pack their own treats. Right. One thing we did that was really fun um, was uh, we made watermelon soup. Um, they loved that and they put herbs in it. They, put, they went out in the garden, they picked mint and fennel and lemon balm and they mashed it together and then we blended it with a stick blender and it was surprisingly delicious. But then we made popsicles out of it with those oh. freezer things and they love that and they've been eating on them ever since. So um, yeah, I mean, I think that is <laughs> another way that uh, another thing they can do indoors that really like small cooking. Just right. simple experimental cooking is really fun for them. And I always like to, we take a regular recipe and then do something inventive with it that they say, you know, I think that would be really good with mashed bananas. Well, let's find out, right? Or whatever. But giving them that, again, the opportunity to experiment is, is pretty rich. So um, if you are watching this after the done, if you're watching it on YouTube and you have a YouTube login, put your own ideas about what might be uh, something that you've done that is fun uh, in the comment section so that other people can uh, see what you have uh, come up with or any suggestions or ideas that you have about what's been discussed today. And thank you very much. And Rita, thank you very much for all these wonderful oh. ideas. We're passionate grandmothers. So, yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the oh. chance to share some ideas with you.